welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and I am here um, to serve you as I serve myself because really we all are one. Spiritual beings, that's what we really are. And we're having these human experiences that seem sometimes to be so overwhelming, so insurmountable, so out of our control, because they are. But what if we truly understood that we are spiritual beings having human experiences and we find a way to live more fully in the midst of this. I'm so glad you're here. Journey. Journey. Harriet Tubman says, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars, to change the world. Journey. When was the last time something you were doing in your life resonated with you as truly reaching for the stars? What about it caused you to feel like you could really succeed? What fears did you have? And what fears did you have to let go of in order to move forward? Journey. today's exercise from the art of noticing by rob walker 131 ways to spark creativity find inspiration and discover joy in the everyday look for flaws you can usually you usually come to a museum and orient yourself towards the artworks artist nina kachaduran has observed and a lot of things in your literal and metaphorical peripheral vision are ruled out as things not worth looking at. But questioning what deserves attention and what doesn't helped guide Kachadurian to an unusual object she called dust gathering. An audio tour of the Museum of Modern Art centered entirely on the museum's dust. Where it collects, who cleans it, how it's kept to a minimum, and so on. To create this tour, she interviewed behind-the-scenes personnel extensively, but she also got used to the idea of zeroing in on the existence of dust bunnies in the crispy, crisply pristine museum. It's weird to go there and feel a domestic sense of that building now, Kachadurian later told an interviewer. It's brought it down to earth in a strange way for me, I always found MoMA intimidating and kind of a temple. And of course, that is part of what museums are designed to make visitors feel. The sense of reverence is a big part of the power to direct your attention. Challenge that. Here's some ideas of other ways you can challenge that idea. Listen to what other patrons say to one another or what the staff says to them. Musician and artist John Kennenberg once created a sound map of the Art Institute of Chicago, recording various casual snippets. No flashes, a guard warned patrons near American Gothic, for instance. In another gallery, he captured an exchange he summarizes as, 
Visitor Questions the Quality of the Art Institute's Impressionism Collection While Speaking with Security. Follow his example and listen to what's going on around you. Here's another idea. Conduct an unrelated activity. Maybe it's worth playfully accepting the notion of a museum as mere background, an environment we inhabit accident or incidentally, as we do other things. What can those other things be? Several museums have experience with opening their spaces to early morning or off-hour meditations and yoga sessions. Come up with your own physical or mental health regimen suitable to your favorite museum, and then share it with others. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Mona Brooks offers an interesting discussion about um, the idea of whether or not artists truly love all of the work that they do. And she uh, writes about it in a book called Drawing with Children, a Creative Method for Adult Beginners Too. And here's what she says on the matter. Number one, if an artist does five paintings, how many do you think they will like enough to frame and want to show people? All groups that she talked to easily and consistently answered one or maybe two. Number two, out of the five drawings, how many do you think they will dislike enough that they will not want others to see to see them and will want to start over and discard them entirely? Consistent answer again, one or two. Number three, what do you think they will do with the one or two left over? Small children will answer, give it to grandma or save it in my drawer. Adults seldom make any response, but once in a while say, save them. I'm chuckling about that give it to grandma one because as an art teacher, you're always being given um, artwork. <laughs> and I have very mixed feelings about that. Uh, that I know on some level, some children might, uh, uh, want to truly give it to me because they've made it for me. But many times I've noticed it's just, they have drawn it, but they don't know what to do with it. So then they turn it into a kind act to give it to me. Um, because the other alternative is it would go into the recycle bin. <laughs> and the beautiful thing about children is they never necessarily, I will say as they get older, this changes, but they usually never think that their art should be thrown away. <laughs> okay. Number three, what do you think they will do with the one or two? Okay. I mentioned that one. Number four, why don't you give yourself the same privilege that you would give an artist? No one ever says a word. They sit there looking at me in confusion. Number five, why do you think you have to like everything you do? The total silence continues. Even the four-year-olds realize the ridiculous expectations they place on themselves. Number six, if you do five paintings with me today, how many of them can you expect to like 
to like real well. <laughs> they smile and answer one, maybe two. Then when I ask, can you expect to dislike something ab about one or two of them? They have this relieved look on their faces and respond, yes. And when I ask, what will you do when you dislike something? It is very easy for them to simply realize they can make changes or start over without risking their self-esteem or feeling like a failure. It is equally a relief to them when I remind them that artists seldom finish a piece of artwork in one sitting and that they too can continue working on something at a later date. If you don't come to grips with unrealistic expectations, you may find yourself giving up before you begin. When an adult beginner doesn't like his or her first couple of drawings, he tends to throw them away and conclude he has no ability. When a child tells an adult she doesn't like something about her drawing, it is quite common for the adults to begin praising the drawing and trying to talk the child into liking it. Adults act as if it would be a terrible experience for a child to dislike something about his or her work. If you do this, you rob a child of the ability to solve problems and develop creative thinking skills. It also creates tremendous stress to have to live up to false expectations. Well, talk about a piece of advice that could carry into all areas of our lives. Allowing children to be disappointed. Folks, we've lost the ability to let them do that. And it's not going to bode well because we all know that life presents us with disappointments. And I like framing it that way. It is a presentation of a disappointment because we get to decide what to do with that assessment and that information and really the circumstance that we have in front of us. We get to choose. Now, it may not always be comfortable and it may not always seem like a happy decision in that moment. But that's when the real adulting comes into play. And so how else will we prepare children if we don't let them practice it? Yes, it's about drawing, but I can honestly say as an art teacher and as an artist, I have been taught more about how to handle life through art and through creative venues and mediums than I have really with any other thing that I've done. Because I do believe art heals, art consoles, art comforts. Yes, art can be its own um, profession. That is true as well. And of course, um, I invite anyone who has that nudging to, to move in that direction. But it is so much more than that. Continuing on today um, with the What is Prayer series, introduced um, based on a book by Henry Nowen called Spiritual Direction. And here is his essay on prayer as crying out to God. Prayer, first of all, is crying out to God from the heart. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my sighing is a prayer from the heart. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for you, to you do I pray. Psalm 5, 1, 1 and 2. There is so much fear and agony in us. Fear of people, fear of God, and much raw, undefined, free-floating anxiety. I wonder if fear is not our main obstacle to prayer. When we enter into the presence of God and start to sense that huge reservoir of fear in us, 
We want to run away into the many distractions that our busy world offers us so abundantly. But we should not be afraid of our fears. We can confront them, give words to them, cry out to God, and lead our fears into the presence of the one who says, Don't be afraid, it is I. Our inclination is to reveal to God only what we feel comfortable in sharing. Naturally, we want to love and be loved by God. But we also want to keep a little corner of our inner life for ourselves, where we can hide and think our secret thoughts, dream our own dreams, and play with our own mental fabrications. We are often tempted to select carefully the thoughts that we bring into the conversation with God. What makes us so stingy? Maybe we wonder if God can take all that goes in our minds, goes on in our minds and hearts. Can God accept our hateful thoughts, our cruel fantasies, and our bizarre dreams? Can God handle our primitive urges, our inflated illusions, and our exhausted, our exotic mental castles? This withholding from God of a large part of our thoughts leads us onto a road that we probably would never consciously want to take. It is the road of spiritual censorship, editing out all the fantasies, worries, resentment, and disturbing thoughts we do not wish to share with anyone, including God, who sees and knows all. When we hide our shameful thoughts and repress our negative emotions, we can easily spiral down the emotional staircase to hatred and despair. Far better it is to cry out to God like Job, pouring out to God our pain and anger and demanding to be answered. A number of years back, Pierre Wolf wrote a wonderful little book on uncensored prayer. It is, God, it is called May I Hate God, and it touches on the very center of our spiritual struggle. Our many unexpressed fears, doubts, anxieties, resentments, he says, prevent us from tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord. Anger and hatred, which separates us from God and others, can also become the doorway to greater intimacy with God. Religious and secular taboos against expressing negative emotions evoke shame and guilt, only by expressing our anger and resentment directly to God in prayer will we come to know the fullness of love and freedom. Only in pouring out our story of fear, rejection, hatred, and bitterness can we hope to be healed. The Psalms are filled with the raw and uncensored cries and agonies of God's people pouring out to God and asking for deliverance. Here's some examples. Psalm 22, 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and am not silent. Psalm 77, 1 and 2. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. Psalm 86, 1. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. The more we dare to show our whole trembling self to God, as did the ancients who prayed the Psalms, the more we will be able to, in, to sense that God's love, which is perfect love, casts out fears, purifies our hearts, and heals our hatreds.